Ronan rolled his suitcase out the door of the guest cottage on his parents' estate and headed for the main house. Skirting the infinity pool looking over the Hollywood Hills, he let himself in through the back door and into the kitchen. It smelled like burnt toast, which meant they were between cooks again. Every other year, his mom, or his dad, decided they could make their own meals and let their private chef go. It would last maybe a month before they hired one back. His mom looked up from buttering a piece of black charcoal. Born Gail Benson, his mom had long ago legally changed her name to Greer Bennett after two of her all-time favorite movie stars. She was in her early fifties, but didn't look much older than him. Ronan had inherited both her willowy frame and her cinnamon-colored hair, and hoped he'd inherit her agelessness as well. She looked up and smiled until she saw the suitcase. You heading out again? I feel like you just barely got home, she said. Off to two more concert stops in Texas, he said. You ever plan on finishing the documentary? His dad asked, walking in and kissing his wife in the cheek. The question stabbed into Ronan's chest where an aching wound had long ago begun to fester. Two and a half years was an eternity to spend on any film, let alone a documentary on a rock band. But he never could have predicted that everything would go to hell weeks after he'd started filming. When he'd first pitched the expose to Asher for the streaming service his best friend had kicked off for Ridgeway Media Industries, it had seemed like a cakewalk, a way of killing two birds with one stone. Now he couldn't let it go for more reasons than he could count. He owed it to himself, to Landry, and all five of the brave women who were getting on stage every day to show the world they wouldn't let murder and mayhem stop them. I'm close, he said. It was only a partial lie. He had almost all the footage he needed, while at the same time it didn't feel like he'd ever have enough. His dad saw through him, raising a dark, bushy brow in his direction. Strong and fit for a man who'd just turned sixty, his dad had barely any white in his beard, but the wrinkles around eyes as gray as Ronan's made him look his age in a way his mom's face didn't. No matter how much we're enjoying a project, we still have to call it quits at some point. Either the money or our energy will run out if you don't, his dad said. Ronan would never admit how right his dad actually was just like he wouldn't tell him that the budget for the documentary had long stopped coming from RMI's cups and had been bleeding into his profits from his movie, The Secret of Us. He was hoping to recoup the losses with a sequel to the film. The new movie was going to be the first thing the production studio Asher had bought and handed over to Ronan would make. His gut flipped with anticipation, thinking about everything he was going to accomplish as president of Ravaged Storm Productions. With the scripts, the decisions, and the money fully in his hands at last, he wasn't going to have to listen to a sea of rejections before doing what he really wanted. He just had to finish the damn documentary, hire an assistant, and get to work. Is your head hurting? His mom's concerned question drew him back to the fact he'd been rubbing the scar on his temple. A flicker of panic ran through him that he'd gotten good at pushing aside. His injury hadn't truly hurt in months, but the nightmares and the waves of anxiety still threatened to pull him under on a regular basis. The powerlessness he'd felt the day of the attack would wash over him at unexpected moments, and he'd live through it all over again. He'd obsess over ways he could have prevented being cuffed, taped, and thrown into a tub by Paisley Kim's attacker. He was still working through it. Therapy and hand-to-hand -hand combat had helped. Not really he told her. Both his parents were staring at him with that look, the one that said as much as they cared about him, they had some tough love speech to deliver. We feel like the longer you stick around the band, the harder it's going to be for you to move on, his dad said gently. Ronan didn't feel like he was ever going to move on, not because of what had happened in Albany, but because of a blue-eyed, black-haired drummer who'd stolen his heart and never given it back. A woman he'd hurt, and who hadn't led him close enough to her again to apologize. He'd almost found a way in with Landry's help. They'd concocted a scheme that would have given him a fighting chance, but then she'd been murdered, and Adria's sister had been kidnapped. While Ronan hadn't felt the loss in the same way as Landry's family had, he'd still been shaken up by the events of that awful night at Swan River Pond, long before the attack in Albany ever had impacted him. He'd considered Landry a friend, and when she died, he'd wanted to mourn her with the rest of the daisies. But they'd scuttled into the woodwork.